I mean, when it's your life's work and you want to leave the world a better place for kids, especially the most vulnerable kids, you, you really, you stick with it. You don't give up. Patty Lyons brought her passion for protecting children to Hawaii in the 1960s, and she would make a lasting impact on countless Hawaii families, as well as the state's child welfare system. Lyons fought nonstop over nearly five decades to prevent abuse and neglect and ensure that every child has a safe home. Her story is next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. It's hard to estimate how many lives have been touched by Patty Lyons, either directly through her casework or indirectly through the policies she championed. In this edition of Long Story Short, we'll hear the inspirational and sometimes heartbreaking story of this social worker who's devoted her life to the well-being of children who had nowhere else to turn. Patty Lyons helped establish important safety net programs like Child Protective Services and Healthy Start. But they didn't come easily. Her crusade has demanded decades of persistence as Lyons battled not only the evils of abuse, but a bureaucratic system resistant to change. Almost all of your adult life, you've been protecting children and advocating for children. What was your own childhood like? Well, my own childhood was in um, a little town called Ellettsville in Indiana. And I grew up with my grandmother, my grandfather, until he died. It was, it was a very good life, even though we were quite poor. Now, where were your parents? Well, my mother was quite young when, when I was born. She had eloped uh, with my father, who was somewhat older. And um, it just didn't work out uh, for them. Um, it was unheard of almost to get a divorce in those times, but they did. My mother was just too immature at that time to take care of me. So you, you lived in a very small town with your grandmother and grandfather, and you were didn't, didn't have a lot, but was, was it a happy childhood? It was happy, because my grandmother, you, you've heard of unconditional love. Well, my grandmother gave me unconditional love, and so did my grandfather. I mean, they would have done anything for me. What of them do you think you took with you as you progressed in life? Well, it was my grandmother who was the strong person. She was the one who said, don't ever give up. You know, I mean, that stayed with me all my life. The only time I'd ever gone out of Indiana was um, to uh, William Woods College, which is in Fulton, Missouri. It's a girls, was a girl's school then. And my grandmother had saved the money all those years to send me there. Did you have a plan when you went to college? Did your grandmother have advice for you about what she'd like to see you do? Or did you have your own ideas about what you were gonna do? She wanted me to be a teacher. So I took a job in Nice Town High School teaching high school students for two years. And that made her happy. She was happy about that. But Patty Lyons already knew she wanted to be a child welfare worker. The teaching job was short-lived, but pivotal, since one of Lyons' female students would fuel her passion for her future career. The girl was so traumatized that she couldn't give an oral book report in class. She came um, to me one day after school and told me about the abuse she was having in her own family. And she said that she would hide under the bed when she knew her mother was very angry and her mother would come with a broom handle and her mother would go mm. like this under the bed and it would of course hurt Joan a lot and she said uh, that could she just write her book report. So I asked the class, I said look we've been through this two or three times now, could Joan just give the book report in writing and they agreed. So that's how she passed the class. Then I was doing, uh, directing a play, and she applied 
she came in and said she wanted to apply for a role in the play. I gave her the lead. She did very well in the play because she didn't play herself. She played a mother. Then I was leaving that year. I, I was not going to teach anymore. She begged me to stay. And, and I said, Joan, you'll be okay because, you know, um, the teachers have seen what you can do now. You'll be all right. I found out from my neighbor, who was the head of a mental hospital, about two years later. She said, oh, you taught in Knightstown High School, didn't you? She said, um, we had a girl commit suicide um, over the weekend. And I said, who? What, what was her name? And she told me, Joan. Joan. And she said, um, she drank a quart of tequila and was on her medications. And they couldn't revive her. That made me feel so guilty because I thought she was going to be okay. And I said, you know, from now on, I'm going to do what I want to do, and that is to help abuse children. And you know, that's that has been my life since. That was in 19. Um, let's see, I graduated with my master's in social work in 61. You, that had been your bent before, but that solidified the goal? That solidified it. Now you say you felt guilty, but do you think you could have prevented that? Maybe not prevented, but she asked me to pay attention to her. She asked me, please, you know, don't, don't leave. Well, I had to leave, but I could have written her. You know, she wrote me. I still have her letter someplace that she wrote me. I have it at home someplace. And that's how much it's meant to me all these years. I would think that that might also convince you that you were headed into a career where you would have many regrets and a lot of guilt. Is that what happened? Well, that's true. I feel like I've never been able to do enough um, for these kids, especially when they end up in a vegetative state, um, when they've just, uh, or they've died, you know. I, I just feel um, somehow responsible. How can you live with that? I mean, you can't control everything. And um, as you worked in social services, there, was, there were never enough people, and there are probably fewer now to do the work. How do you, how do you live a, a personal life knowing that there, there are all these risks out there in the form of children? You, you finally do have to say, you know, I can't do it all. There's no way I can do it all. I can't prevent every child from being hurt. Um, you just keep on trying. After earning her master's degree in social work from Indiana University, Patty Lyons worked for Indiana's State Department of Public Welfare. Then in 1965, she followed her husband to Hawaii and found a job with Child and Family Service. While the marriage did not last, the job did. You know, when I went in for a job interview, the director at that time said, well, we'll give you this nice job out here in the back. It's a, it, we have a new offices, and you'll be seeing middle income and upper income people. And a lot of them will be military officers and their wives. And I said, well, do you have anything else? She said, oh. There's this place way out here on the coast uh, that they're saying that they give to Aloha United Way and that uh, they should get some of the services out there. Where was that place? Why and I. And it did have the highest, you know, um, child abuse rate at that time. Uh, I don't know what it is today. Uh, it, she, but she tried her best to talk me out of it, and she said. Look, they have no transportation out there. They have no welfare office. They have no doctors. They have no dentists. It's the highest crime rate in the island. And they're mostly Hawaiians and they hate Howleys. I said, 
I'll take that job. <laughs> <laughs> but she said, they're not going to work with you. You've got this white skin, and you came from Indiana, and hey, it's not going to work. Well, within three months, I had a long waiting list of mostly Hawaiian, part Hawaiian families. So I ran into many, many abused children. And I knew I couldn't live with myself unless I did something about it. But Patty Lyons quickly discovered that by doing something, she would be butting heads with an entrenched bureaucracy. She began what would become a battle when she requested a meeting with officials of the State Department of Human Services. I presented all my cases that I had sent to them. When I was leaving because I saw nothing was happening, they said um, something like, uh, well, your philosophy is just different from ours. And I said, how, how is that? They said, well, we believe in keeping children with their own families. Even if their own family is abusing them? Yes. So as I was leaving, I turned around and I said, well, we're going to go higher. And that was the way the conversation ended. When I got back to the Methodist church in the little kitchen where 13 of us were on this first committee, I, I said, what does hire mean? Because <laughs> I had no idea what we were going to do. But we went to the legislator out there, Francis Wong at that time, and uh, started working on developing a child protective service center. What was in place as far as the safety net for children at that time in the, in the late 60s? Well, I, I don't think there was anything. I, I'll tell you the crux of it for me was that a girl came in one day crying and saying that her stepfather was sexually molesting her when her mother would deliver papers in the morning. How old was this girl? This girl was about 12 at that time. And she said, um, I, I don't want to go home. Please don't make me go home. So that's the day that I called and said, you get out here to DHS because this girl should not go home. She should go to a shelter of some sort or a foster home, but not home. A male worker came out the first time I had ever known it to happen with all the cases I had. And the mother told him, oh, it was a poltergeist that did it. And he said, the girl should go home. What did you do then? I, I cried. <laughs> you know, I mean, I just cried because I didn't know what else to do. She went home, home and she ran away, I don't know how many times, but she ended up in a foster home. And um, that, that case hit the newspapers. Francis Wong talked about that case often and said, no, we have to establish, we have to have better laws, and we have to establish a center for these kids. Persuading lawmakers and the news media to pay attention was a breakthrough for Patty Lyons. But some of her fellow social workers and higher-ups at Child and Family Service were wary, even hostile to Lyons and her cause. I was scared every day I was going to be fired because as she told me, the boss at that time at Child and Family Service, she said, we didn't send you out there to make waves. Did you have a fallback plan? If they fire me, then this? I didn't have a fallback plan. I just knew it had to happen. It had to happen. And the first hearing that we had at the legislature, 300 people came in, filled the room. In that year, 67, there were 69 children statewide reported. And the next year, there were over 1,000 because we kept it in the newspapers every day it was in the newspapers. And did all those children get some help? Did the government then respond? Yes, because we established 
a Child Protective Service Center. It was there at the old children's hospital on Kuakini Street. So you've had to square off against your own co-workers and the government who, who had a duty to protect children. That's right. That's right. And that's hard, you know, because, hey, we all like to be loved or at least liked. And did you falter at that point? Did you think, whoa, maybe I'm the one who's, who's off base here? No, because I had seen the kids. I had seen the burned kids. I had seen the battered kids. I'd seen the bruised kids. I'd seen them all. So, no, I wasn't about to give up. And so you eventually rose to head the agency. Yes. Child and Family Service. And you saw the state government create a uh, Child Protective Services division. Yes. Yes. But life it didn't go on happily ever after. There were continuing challenges. There were. And every time we would go back, we would establish a committee if we needed to, you know, to, to get in there and fight some more. All of this time that you were advocating for neglected and abused children, you were raising a couple of kids yourself. I had two sons, yes. And you were a single mom? <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. How did that go? Well, you know, that's hard, especially uh, a mom with sons. And um, it, it was a rough time for me. I think it was a rough time for them because I didn't have that much to give. Between what I was doing with abused children and, and you know, ha had to work, had to support them, and I wanted to do this work anyway. And then uh, taking care of them and it was not easy. Make any mistakes as a parent that you'd care to share? Um, I think that I was overly committed to what I was doing for abused children. And I think I missed a lot of good times with my kids. While Patty Lyons managed heart-wrenching abuse cases, battled the bureaucracy, and struggled to raise her sons, she also faced down cancer four times. First um, uh, cancer I had was uh, that year that I moved here in 65. It was, I had it, uh, an operation in Indiana. It was thyroid cancer. And then in um, 1986, I had a diagnosis of breast cancer. And I've had um, a lot of skin cancer all, all along. That's always been a given. And then in 2003, I had a diagnosis of bladder cancer. But, you know, it, I always just did what I needed to do and got over it. And, and um, it didn't linger or bother me like, oh, it's going to come back or something like that. And so far, it, it hasn't. After more than two decades at Child and Family Service, Patty Lyons was unexpectedly drawn to a new endeavor, one that would expand her efforts beyond Hawaii and consume the rest of her career. It started with a work trip in 1987 to the Philippines. That's where Lyons learned about the plight of Filipino street children who were starving, homeless, and were being sexually molested. Lyons returned to Hawaii with a mission to help. Her desperate fundraising appeals led her to a wealthy Kahala widow with ties to the Philippines, Mrs. Consuelo Zobel Alger. So the next morning, she called and she said, um, hello, dear. I thought, oh, well, that, you know, that sounds good. And she said, I have your first $15,000 check. Now, how much is this shelter going to cost per year anyway? And I said, it's going to cost fifty to 55000 U.S. per year. And she said, oh, I can manage that. That was the beginning. One day she said, you know, dear, I've never had any children of my own. And now I have 40 children. I think I might like to do this forever, but I have no idea how much I'm worth. I own 5% of the oldest and largest company in the Philippines. It's my family's company. But I don't know, maybe I'm worth 7 million. 
maybe 10. I might even be worth 15. When she left all of her shares in that company to the foundation that she then established, she was worth 150 million. Wow. And she gave all that to us. I, I can tell that as soon as you um, embraced the Baggio children, you were, you were on the move. But how did it end at CFS? Well, at CFS, you know, I had always had a pile of paper, you know, almost up to my nose in front of me and handling personnel problems and, you know, because every place has them. And I thought, oh, I want to do something different. You wanted to be closer to the people you were serving. Yes. I wanted to look people in the eyes again. And I, I wanted to know what's going on with them. So I, I'd been thinking about it. But then here this is. Now, I call it a miracle. First, she said, I will pay half your salary at Child and Family Service, and I will fund a program there if they will let you come and help me establish this foundation. So she did a program in Hawaii. In fact, she did one in Waianae. She funded it. The more I saw what could be done, what could be built, I thought, oh, wow. I wonder if she wants me to help permanently. Well, then when she became ill, she said, you know, I'm not going to be able to follow through with this. So would you take the job full time? And I said, yes. <laughs> it was so good to get back with the kids again, with the families, and do a, something in that country that nobody else was doing. You know, these are kids who, they, they don't have any resources. And, and their parents don't have any resources. So they uh, repackage cigarettes and things like that, you know, to uh, sell little lays as the cars pull up at the stoplights. They scavenge at, at, at the, a dump, a huge at dump. A huge dump, Smoky Mountain it was called then. Um, yeah, anything that they can get, you know, to sell, uh, to earn enough for a little bit to eat. Well, what did you do for them? For the ones who really were being sexually molested by the pedophiles, we established shelters. If they can live with their parents, they're still in squatter areas, meaning the cardboard, the mm -hmm. tin roofs. So we did some housing projects, small houses, but uh, with sewage, because they always had you know, raw sewage just running. And we, we put in uh, some sewage systems, uh, some clean water, the fun part of the last 20 years has been the building. The building of that in the Philippines from north to south. We named it Consuelo because her name in Spanish means consolation or hope. And that's what we were trying to give to people. She said, I want to spend my heaven doing good on earth. And I want to let fall from heaven a shower of roses. And what matters in life is not great deeds, but great love. You pattern my life after that, and you give hope to those who have lost it. And that's what you're doing. I hope so. I hope so. And I think so. But you'll never be done. The job is never finished. You'll never be able to stop all the abuse. That's true. That's true. And that pains me uh, because I wish it could be eliminated. I wish there could be an adult for every child that gave that child unconditional love. There won't be. Have you ever um, come across somebody that you helped long ago, didn't know how it, the story would turn out, and have the chance to see that person again many years later? I did. I did. And it was a person, a family from Waianae. They lived in a junkyard. The mother had abandoned the five children. And the father was depressed, very depressed, and also, you know, angry. So when I walked into that yard saying that I wanted to work with them, he pulled out a shotgun and he said, 
don't come any further. But he called me a little bit later because I had left a, a card out there at the edge of the road. And uh, um, he said, okay, I've decided to work with you. So I worked with that family for a long time. But this one girl was 10 years old at, at the time. I said, what would you like to be when you grow up? And she said, I, I, I'd like to be a nurse. And about 15 years later, something like that, I walked into Straub to go to dermatology. And I had my head down like this. I wasn't paying attention because I had a headache, for one thing. And when I got into the room, in walks this beautiful young woman. And she said, Mrs. Lyons, do you remember me? And I said, how could I ever forget you? It's things like that that keep you going no matter what. Although Patty Lyons is officially retired, she remains on the board of the Consuelo Foundation and continues to advocate for the health and security of children here and abroad. In contrast to the criticism she endured early in her career, Lyons has been honored repeatedly for her lifetime of service to Hawaii's children and families. She hopes she'll be remembered for giving hope to those who had lost it. And her story reminds us all of the power of one person to advance change and save lives. For Long Story Short and PBS Hawaii, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho kako. For audio and written transcripts of this program and all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. Dickie Wong was in the legislature. And, you know, he'd been a real fighter. He was a big help. Neil Abercrombie was a big help. Uh, Charlie Toguchi. And who was the other dissident? Clayton He, I think. Ben Caetano was around oh, and, that time as ben, well. And Ben, yes. That's right. Yeah. What, what a time, I'll tell you. I wouldn't have the energy to do it now. But I'm really glad we stuck with it then.